It was crazy. This script is going to be a bit of a challenge for me. Well, maybe for you, Dave, because you wrote it. I just sit here and read stuff that you wrote. My job is easy. Yes! Not because it will be difficult for me to find weird things about Britain. It may well be one of the most peculiar places in the world, but because the last two episodes were written by Danny, so try as I will, this one will surely pale in comparison. Holy inferiority complex, Batman! That's right. <laughs> know your place, Dave! Danny is the king. Let's call him Prince. Prince Danny, I'm the king. Hail to the king, baby. Nevertheless, I have been waiting patiently in line, as is the British way. Waiting patiently in line. I had, Americans don't really know the word cue, right? I was like, yeah, yeah. Just, 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 just lowered myself down a little. Is my, is my head getting cut off on this one? Yes! Yes, yes. Oh no. <laughs> but now I'm too low on this one. What happens? <laughs> Sometimes this happens and all my cameras are always in exactly the same place and I'm like, oh, clean lady must have bumped it with the hoover or something. Liar! So you're like, oh no, oh no. It'll be fine. Am I going to fix it? No, of course not. Of course not. We'll fix it in post. You're not going to pin this on me. Uh, yeah, so do Americans know the word Q? Because they'll be like, oh yeah, Q here. Americans call it standing in line. What the fuck's wrong with the word Q? It's nice. It's perfect. It's not three words. Come on, America. You should do better than this. You should. For another one of these to come up, so I shall give it my best shot. That being said, sit back, relax, butter up those crumpets as we take a closer look at some of the more bizarre aspects of British life. A mate of mine, he's American, and he's like a very American guy. Like, if you picture America, he's from, um, he's from Montana. He wears those shirts with the checkers. He, like, he, he knows how to hunt. Like, he's an American. Like, roar! Hooah! <laughs> and uh, he did one of those ancestry tests. We were at dinner the other day, and he's like, Oh, dude, I just got the results of my ancestry test. And he's reading it and he's like, I'm 62% British. I'm only 49% British, according to ancestry. <laughs> Even though in every way I'm more British than him. So he came around to, I had a couple of mates around for steaks at my house the other day. And instead of making this dude steak, I just make him beans on toast and fish and chips while me and my mate enjoy like fat steaks on the barbecue. And it's like, well, yeah, man, because you're like 62% British. I'm teaching you the ways. And now we've got like a little WhatsApp group chat. And always sending him like British flags, the Union Jack. I'm like, yes, God save the king. Yes, yes, old chap. Come on now. Standing in line. I know I mentioned this briefly during the introduction. Very briefly, as you should, Dave. Short introductions, my man. Two minutes 43, not bad. But it is such a fundamental part of British life that it definitely deserves its own entry. I'm having a stroke up here. That it definitely deserves its own entry. Whilst most of the countries I visited have some sort of system whereby people are able to form a queue and wait, nobody does it quite like the British. Seriously, if standing in line was an Olympic sport, then the British team would take home the gold because they'd be waiting patiently outside. Four out of ten for that joke, Dave. Not bad, not good. <laughs> what am I doing? I'm such a dick. Why am I saying that? I'm sorry. It's fine, Dave. I'm sorry. So important is queuing culture to the British that we have a very official set of rules that every nation fo that every native follows slavishly. Is English not your first language? Failure to adhere to these rules will expose to the. M you had one job. Just the one. Failure to adhere to these rules will expose you to the most devastating of British rebukes. The darts like. Come on. Although people who have lived here all their lives develop at least a little resistance to the tart, annoyances, which, for the uninitiated, I'm sure Simon can demonstrate now, already done it, Dave! It can cut through foreign tourists at 20 paces. I once witnessed a well-aimed tut from an elderly lady connect with an American tourist so hard that he took a step back in terror and tripped over his suitcase. <laughs> the power of the British tut! If I were to list all the British rules for queuing, then I would have to release a small book. Fortunately, there are three main ones, and if you stick to these while as a visiting tourist, then you should manage to keep yourself both out of prison and the gutter. Fuck yeah! <laughs> they are no joining your friends. Simply, this means that when you arrive at the queue, you will, without fuss, join the very back. Oh my god, yeah. I was... we. This, this is so uncomfortable for me. And my wife is not... British, but also like I don't know. The Czechs also queue for shit. I'm like, we were waiting in line outside this. This is an amazing place. Shout out Chocotopia in Prague. Absolutely fucking awesome. You go go if you've got kids and you're in Prague, it's a little bit out of town. Take an Uber or whatever, or take a panda ride where they have the 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 child seats in there. Go to Chocotopia. It's 
dope. They allow you to make like chocolate things with their like their own chocolate. You put it in like a tray. The kids get in the chocolate kitchen and they make all this shit. You don't have to clear anything up. It's awesome. Then there's like a there's a whole soft play there. And also they have their own like chocolate, but uh, like foundation. What the fuck's a tro- plantation? They have like their own chocolate plantation in like Nicaragua or some shit. And so it's also super interesting for Alice. They have all these like pictures and you get to try like the raw cocoa and stuff. Plus a massive soft play. Plus it's not even that expensive. Like I'm like, wait, soft play costs as much as this and I didn't get to make chocolate. Shout out Chocotopia. I go there at least once a month with my kids because you're like, why not? And the chocolate's delicious. I'm sorry, what were we talking about? Sorry, uh, what were we talking about? All right, so yeah, I'm queuing outside of this place. And uh, because they have like some special Children's Day events. Children's Day, also something that I had no idea about. Do we have that in in the UK? Dave, let me know. How? Do we have that in the UK? People watching. Children's Day? It's something we have here in Czech. And I'm like, okay, cool. And they have like this special event. There's like these Paw Patrol characters. There's a dude making like balloon animals and shit. It's it's quite fancy. It's, there were so many impressive balloons. The balloon animals were crazy. Crazy. So I love this place. <laughs> but we're queuing outside. There's a big queue. And everyone has like a scheduled time or whatever. And we're standing there. And then we see a kid from my kid's school. He's like, oh, hello. And the parents are like, hello, hello. And it's a big queue. And they just join us in the queue. And I'm standing there like, oh, people are judging us. You just did that. What am I supposed to say? Go stand at the back. And I'm just standing there being like, oh, no, people are giving me the eye. They're giving me the eye so bad. And this woman and her husband and the kids are just completely oblivious to it. And I'm like, ah. And my wife looks at me and she's like, and I'm like, (laughs) so uncomfortable. Oh my god, let's get back to it. It doesn't matter if you have a group of friends halfway to the front, they joined the back, and so will you. You may not, under any circumstances, leave the queue. Oh, that's the next rule. Sorry. <laughs> Professionalism. If you are lining up for something that you know may and you know you may be and you know you may be there for several hours, arrive with snacks and an empty bladder. Should you foolishly decide to leave the line at any point, then the person behind you is under no obligation to let you back in again. You were weak. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. No savesy places, he. Don't make your problem their problem. Finally, and this is without doubt the most important rule, queue jumping is liable to get you lynched or at the very least tuttered into the nearest hospital. This inexcusable social obscenity is taken so seriously that on the London Underground, at least, it's an actual crime. No fucking way. Is that true? ChatGPT, I need you. Now lately, ChatGPT, since upgrading to this new model, has been given really long answers. So what I do is I just ask it for a one-word one answer, which is the simplicity that I need. Just in your own time. Connecting, connecting. Yo, yo, what up, Holmes? Um, listen, I am doing a video right now, and I just don't want you to give me a long answer about how it's fascinating that I'm making a video. I want you to answer in one word only. Yes or no okay the question that i have for you is if i'm on the london underground and i jump the queue is that a crime the suspense is killing me yes oh my god i so want to know more but i'm gonna hold off (laughs) oh my god it's actually a crime chat gpt holy oh i love you i don't know (laughs) It's so bad. Dave told me this, but I'm so much more excited when ChatGPT tells me it because, like, Dave might have a small brain. You never know. ChatGPT, fucking giga Chad brain. Absolute Chad brain. These rules and many others are taught to children whilst they're learning to walk. So just as soon as they start queuing, they will not disgrace themselves or their families. And it is, it is, you disgrace your family. This out on you! This out on your cow! Your family will bear that shame for generations. It's like our North Korean equivalent. You know in North Korea, if you commit a crime... I can't believe you don't shut up! Then they also send your kids to prison or some shit like that. And also your kids' kids or whatever. So there's like generational crime. We don't have that, but we have generational shame. And it's like... If your granddad skipped a queue in like 1972, your family will bear that shame for generations. I still feel the shame of my great granddad in 1899 skipping a queue in a 
cocaine parlor. <laughs> I don't know what they had in the bars, but they were definitely having cocaine. I bet my great grandpappy was like, all fucking day! Sorry, great grandpappy, I love you. I never met you. I met my great grandmother. She lived to be like 101 or some shit. <laughs> she was older like this. <laughs> now she's dead. Obviously, it was a long time ago. She'd be like 130 by now. <laughs> like an old ass woman. <laughs> She'd be dead. Some children rip to the goat. Some children will go further than that, though. Having not yet fully developed the highest British level of social awkwardness around any conflict, they will occasionally call out rule breakers with actual words. My then five-year-old son did this the last time we were at Disney World, and there have been a few times when I was more proud of him. When we were queuing for a ride one ride or another, a group of locals climbed over the barrier and pushed in front of us. Obviously, we huffed and tutted, but this was completely ineffective. Then, <laughs> you're like, and the Americans are just like, after net, why am I doing an Australian accent? All right, I'm just taking my place in this line right now, right here. Yeah, yeah, you got it now. No, don't do that. <laughs> I don't know why that's so southern. Then, fully aware that doing so would technically mean he had to join the back of the queue, my son walked the distance to the nearest Disney cast member, pointed out the miscreants, explained the severity of their crimes, and made such a fuss that they were eventually ushered to the back of the line. Where they belonged, you goddamn right! I wish I had half the balls of your son, Dave. I'd just be like, hmm. <sighs> Very bad. Mm, mm, very bad. Very upset at the situation. <laughs> and, oh, this is happening in my head. I'm not saying this out loud. I'm just like... <laughs> Had he carried out this public service in the UK, he may well have received a knighthood. Hot and cold taps, or faucets, for Americans. Everywhere else I have traveled in the world, and granted that it's not that many places, they have the same arrangement when it comes to hot and cold water. On the back of the sink, you have a mixer tap which allows you to create a single stream of whatever temperature you most desire. In the majority of homes around the UK, though, this is slightly different. Each sink is usually equipped with both a hot and cold tap. Look, the queuing one, we've got right. We are correct on this. I won't hear any uh, rebuttals to that. The hot and cold tap thing, where you have the two separate ones, is insane it makes no sense if dave tries to defend this i'm going to flay him alive wow that i i uh, there's gonna be no consequences i'm sorry i said that please don't tell toby in hr this as i'm sure you can imagine can lead to some complicated hand washing sessions you basically have three choices you can either use both tabs to fill the base and then wash your hands in that water if you're doing that you're a psycho but seriously, we're busy, and who has the time for that? Psychos. Or you can elect to just use one tap or the other and end up freezing your hands to the point where they no longer have any feeling or scalding them to the point where skin graft is a real possibility. I can't even remember. I think what I'd do is I'd just turn on both and then be like this. Because <laughs> that's the insane world that British people have decided that we must live in. Or this is what I do. You turn on both taps and shuffle between the tremendous speed. I told you in order to trick your nervous system into believing that you were using warm water whilst all of this is fun old-fashioned and most importantly very british there is is there a reason behind this madness well i'm glad you asked although local councils are working tirelessly to cover every inch of green space with flimsy flat bag housing a lot of british homes are really really old i don't just mean old in the american sense of the word i've lived in at least one house which predated the american constitution and not by a little bit yeah my nan lived in a house that was made in the 15th century <laughs> It was so, like, weird. It had giant walls, but then all of, like, the floors, you could look through them because they're just made of wood. You're like, oh, hello. <laughs> you just look through the gap to be like, that's downstairs. But then the walls were, like, this thick. But for reasons. In the earlier days of running hot water, before the advent of fancy new combination boilers, hot and cold water supplies were kept separate to prevent cross-contamination. Cold water came in fresh from a main supply connected to your house and was fit for human consumption. Hot water? Not so much. This water would start its journey from the main supply before traveling into a storage tank, usually in a loft or attic. There it would sit, surrounded by spiderwebs, bat droppings, the occasional dead mouse or rat, and pretty much any other miscellaneous crap that found its way into the loft space until it was needed. Well, fine, but if you have a mixing tap and you turn it to fully cold, it's not going to be taking any of the fucking hot water, is it? So it's fine for drinking. Like, I've even do this. I don't drink what out of the hot water tap. Maybe this is like an old British thing that I need to get over because nowadays it's fine. But still, it's like stored in the hot water tank. You don't want to drink that. Right? Right? You didn't know how long it's been there? I mean, probably not that long because it gets a good turnover. But like, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. But just drink, just, just turn it all the way to cold. What the fuck? 
Then it would flow down into, a, either into a gas or coal-fired back boiler or an electric immersion heater. For those of you who've never been unfortunate enough to have one, it's basically a massive kettle that, given about an hour and frankly an obscene amount of electricity, will provide you with a small bathtub full of hot-ish water. Yeah, if you're lucky, or it'll just fill up the bottom so you're like kind of bathing in this much water. <laughs> so I remember being a kid, we had some old-ass bathroom like with all the separate tanks, taps, and it had this massive bath, this massively deep bath. And you'd end up being like, oh, well, I'm not going to wait like an hour to run the bath. So you'd just be like, yeah, just fill it up a little bit and then just splash around in the water like a peasant. <laughs> Given the many opportunities that, for this water to become contaminated, keeping the two supplies well away from each other was considered good practice. So there you have it. As slightly more up-to-date water heating systems get installed, so do fancy new mixer taps. But as one of the most popular British idiom states, if it's not broken, don't fix it. So individual taps are likely to be a thing for quite a while longer. And another person who's a psycho. If if you are making a new house and putting in the separate tanks, taps, you're a fucking psycho. Don't do that. Like, I've just renovated a house. There are no separate taps because I'm not an insane person. It's all just one and then you twist it around and it mixes that shit together to a perfect temperature. Uh, there's even like a step beyond that. Everyone must know, like, no thermostatic showers where you just select the temperature on the side. Now I'm like, if I've got a mixing shower, I'm like, fuck that shit. Like, I'm not in that mixing shower, like, where you're like trying to find the right place. Thermostatic, baby! You just press the button and good to go! As an interesting side note, I once lived in a house with a particularly old-fashioned version of the electric immersion heater. This heater had a small electrical fault, which really kept you on your toes. The thermostat, which was supposed to switch off the heating element when the water reached a reasonable temperature, didn't work. So if you were to plug this heater in and forget about it, you'd end up with an 80-gallon tank of boiling water in the center of the house. Not only was this rather loud, it would often result in huge gouts of steam billowing from the emergency valve on the top of the tank. <laughs> Holy shit steam cooker uh steam cooker uh pressure cooker fortunately this emergency valve functioned perfectly if it had for any reason ceased to do so then the resulting explosion would very likely destroy the entire house simpler times yeah dude also anytime you'd run just purely hot water you will get like third degree burns because you're just dumping your hand in boiling water is that th could that be th probably not third degree burns probably second degree burns Connecting. Oh, oh connection refit. Retry. Failed. Don't do that to me. Yo, ChatGPT. What up, Home Slice? I need. Okay, I was talking. I would need you to answer this in one of three ways. One, first degree burns. Two, second degree burns. Three, third degree burns. I have a tap that is putting out boiling water and I hold my hand in it for one second. What type of burns do I get? Second degree to burns. Nailed it. Second degree burns, baby. Yes. By the way, telling chat GPT, you know, multiple choice answers. <laughs> it's like no fucking what? Are you still listening to me, you psycho? Stop listening! Oh no, I called it a psycho. When the robots come, it's going to take me. Hopefully it didn't send in time. And now back to your regularly scheduled program. The broken glass pub rule. Before I explain this, I'd like to do something potentially dangerous. I'm so confident that every single British person knows this rule that I'd like to invite Simon to have a guess before I will tell you. Okay, editor. I'm awake. Let's make the sound. Imagine this is a broken glass. I slide it off the table. I slide it off the table. And it makes the crashing sound. Way! Hey! <laughs> everyone. Everyone. Woo! Dude, where, where I went to school with, like, there's this giant refectory where we'd all eat. And you'd get, you'd go up, you'd get a tray, you'd fill it with food, and then you'd go sit down. And if anyone ever dropped their tray, like, you just, like, tripped and dropped your tray or something, there'd be, like, hundreds of people would all be like, Way! <laughs> It was crazy! Uh, and then sometimes you do it so hard, like, so many people would be doing this, the table would collapse, and then it'd be like, Wah! Kids are psychos. Obviously, I'm aware that this has the potential to add several minutes to the tangent, Simon. About 40 seconds.
but that's just how we roll. Imagine, if you will, the following scenario. You and a group of your formerly most cool friends, the one you used to go out with for three or four times a week before things like proper jobs, marriages, and children got in the way. They've gathered for what is now your annual drinking session. Theoretically, this is going to be an awesome bender. You've promised each other that you're going to drink like the old days, stay out on night, and eat a cold doner kebab with cheese and chili sauce for breakfast. In reality, no, it's all bullshit. Well, yeah, you will have work on Monday morning, and although it's only Friday night, you know that you should never attend, attempt such ridiculousness. You'll still be hungover on Thursday. A what? Most importantly, you'll still be hungover, and it's like, yeah, 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 it's the weekends. But you know who I, or, you know, who's not at work or at school on the weekends? My children. You know who wakes up early? My children. So it's like, no, 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 thank you. By the way, none of this has anything to do with what we're talking about. I was just setting the scene and reminding myself that I used to be cool. Okay. Baby, you're still cool. <laughs> anyway, as the evening heats up and mental Terry, who is not allowed in, has not been allowed in your house since that time he did something unspeakable in your bathroom cupboard. Did he take a shit in your bathroom cupboard, Dave? Bra. Tries to make his way back from the bar carrying six pints and twelve shots. He trips over someone's abandoned child and several of the glasses smash on the floor. What is the only socially acceptable response? That's right, everyone in the pub, regardless of whether they know you or not, must at the very least cheer as loudly as they can. Yes! If they're feeling particularly exuberant, jumping onto their feet, pointing at Terry is also acceptable. <laughs> Although, <laughs> it's true. Although in the case of this particular individual, it's not necessarily recommended. Until I first traveled abroad and found myself in a pub just outside of Bordeaux in France. I genuinely believe this was a global custom. Dave just like, there's a glass smash, he's like, way! And everyone's like, oh, monsieur, what are you doing? This is uh, very rude of you. <laughs> As it turns out, it is not. And you can therefore imagine the response I got when after a week I dropped a tray of champagne glasses, I leaped <laughs> cheering to my feet while brandishing my liter glass of Cronenberg. <laughs> oh, Dave, you pretty Brit. It further transpires that not only is this considered unusual behavior, it has the potential to result in you being chased from the pub by a horde of angry members and locals who knew, Oh, get out of here, you roast beef! <laughs> get out of the pub! Your mother was a hamster and your father smelt of elderberries! On the bright side, I got a cool Cronenberg glass out of it, which until the great COVID collapse of collapse of 2014, during which I lost about £2,000 worth of collectible glassware, served me very well. Why do you- Holy shit! Do you collect glasses? Who has £2,000 of collectible glassware? Things that absolutely must be said. British people, you'll always- British people, you will almost- British people, you almost immediately know what I'm talking about. Wait, I don't. For the rest of the world, just watch your favorite British person go at it for a while and you'll get it. An American friend of mine pointed this out, and, and once I noticed, I could not unnotice it. There are certain situations in which the British are completely incapable of proceeding unless a certain word or phrase has been uttered. A good example of this is the word right. I don't quite get it yet. I'm sure I'll get it immediately as soon as Dave clarifies it more, but remember, I don't have a brain like ChatGPT. I have a small brain. Small, tiny brain. Oh, you have all gathered somewhere at the start of some sort of trip. The boring kind that usually involves a car, not the fun kind that usually involves chemicals. The final cup of tea has been consumed and everyone is ready. Now you're just waiting for one member of your group to stand up and say in an authoritative manner, Right, let's go. <laughs> and say in an authoritative manner, Right, let's go. <laughs> it's true. I'll just, right then. Off we go. Similarly, it's impossible for you to part ways in the end of the aforementioned trip without at least one of you uttering, it's been great, we must do this again soon. Yeah, even if you don't mean it, you'll be like, oh, we must do this again soon. And then immediately, like, you scream screaming your head, I've had a terrible time. I've had a terrible time. I'm just polite. The thing is, the use of this phrase has absolutely no bearing on reality. You may have had the worst few days of your entire life. The car could have broken down in the middle of nowhere. Two members of your party might no longer be speaking because after drinking two bottles of tequila, Mike told Alex that two weeks before his wedding, he slept with his wife. But Hell. Or in spite of re repeated requests from everybody else not to do so, Terry ate 12 petrol station pork pies and the resulting farks meant that had anyone tried to light a cigarette in the car, everybody would have died in a spectacular fireball. Zoolander style. None of this matters. 
None of this matters. Until someone has said, it's been great, we must do it again soon, nobody can leave. It's more true than you know, everyone who's not British. I want another example. Try to get through an entire taxi drive without your Brit asking the driver whether they've been busy and what time they are on till. It's much the same way that there was no sincerity in your wish to meet up with Mike, Terry, and Alex anytime again soon, or indeed ever again. You don't care whether the taxi driver has been busy or what time they might finally get to go home. It is just that until those things have been said, the day cannot be continued with. But we got in. He said, Let me tell you something. This country is going down the toilet. I'm getting out of here, my friend, and I'm taking a few of these bastards with me. I said, Have you been busy? If any of you think of any other examples of these essential phrases, please do feel free to add them in the comment section. It will make a nice change to read something that isn't slagging me off or forgetting emus and ostriches mixed up. Wait, did I get emus? Was that me or Dave? I don't even remember. People were saying me on, on, on Twitter, be like, Simon, there's no. I don't even give a sh. Is it like there's no ostriches in Australia? It's just emus? And I was like, Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> Behold the field where I grow my f and see that it is barren! Bo. Okay, I know Danny asked about food in a previous script, but I wanted to come at it in a slightly different way and talk about desserts, more specifically the name of desserts. Well, isn't desserts also more of an American term? Like, we'd, wouldn't British people more use the term pudding? Like, I'll have some pudding. Dessert would be like... I don't know, it feels more modern. Pudding is what? I don't know, you'd be like, yeah, I'm having pudding. And it's not like you're specifically wanting, like, pudding. Like that, that you know, the, the like, the dairy shit. You just want, like, dessert. <laughs> but you call it pudding. Okay? Sadly, more and more pretentious food is sneaking onto the British market. There used to be a time, not so long ago, when if you went out to a restaurant, you could almost guarantee that when you left, you'd be uncomfortably full and ready for a solid mat nap, no matter what time of the day it was. Okay, the food might not have been great, but it would be honest, solid food that would fill you up. Now you're just as likely to receive a massive plate with various tiny globs of food dotted on it as you are to receive a hearty steak and ale pie with mashed potatoes, peas, and onion gravy. I went to a... Have I told this story? Very probably, yes. Like, like a few weeks ago i went to i went to a very fancy restaurant in uh i went to berlin i went to this fancy restaurant and it's one of these fancy restaurants where the food was incredible like there's no doubt it's like this is incredible food and it's all very delicious but it was like there were like nine courses and by the end of it i'm like i'm so so hungry because <laughs> dinner starts at like six it finishes at 10. you've had like these nine courses which are all delicious but i i could literally and i know it's not realistic but i could literally have eaten 10 times that, that amount of food and then i would be full the biggest problem was each course is paired with wine so you have one so first of all you arrive and then like glass of champagne you're like don't mind if i do and then like every course comes with like it's only a little glass of wine but by the time you're done you've drunk like a bottle and a half of wine while you've consumed about three crackers worth of food and you're like wow i'm really quite drunk and really quite hungry and i mean it was great it was a weird it was a good experience but it's like goddamn, i needed a snack afterwards <laughs> Last year, my wife and I went to a local restaurant about which the internet had been going crazy. At first glance, the menu did indeed look promising. I was slightly concerned that the way, the way to the stay, for which I paid £41, was not listed, but I was promised that it came with triple-cooked, hand-cut chips, chips, onion rings, mushrooms, and any number of other delica, de delicious accomplishments. F***ing hell. Learn English! Learn English! any number of other delicious accompaniments so i thought i would give it a go when my plate arrived i immediately understood why they had carefully omitted the weight of the steak it was no bigger than a digestive biscuit and it came with exactly eight chips two onion rings presumably to justify the use of plural on the menu Needless to say, we went to McDonald's on the way home. In today's gastronomically depressing times, there seems to be but one remaining bastion of true British culinary excellence that has not yet been swept away by Heston Blumenthal-inspired crap, and that's the British dessert. While those on the continent, with the possible exception of Italy, seem to prefer a lighter dessert, and Americans will often make do with a bucket of ice cream, British desserts with names like Spotted Dick, Christmas Pudding, and Eaton Mess are not only delicious, but should come across but you you can't even speak yes i can but should you come across them on a menu for the first time they give absolutely no indication as to what they might contain while well, the first one did does it contains dick 
This not only baffles visiting foreigners, but provides us Brits with a feeling of smug superiority that we haven't allowed ourselves since the demise of colonization. <laughs> Ah, the good old days. We, after all, know what they contain. I wouldn't say I'm proud to be British, at least not out loud, because pride in one's culture is the sort of uncouth thing that foreigners do. Yeah, it's so true. It's so true. Seriously, if you're seen waving a flag in Britain, this, yeah, I know what Dave's going to say. You're either a football hooligan or you're a member of the BNP, which is like our nationalist party. Like, you're a racist, basically. I hear you're a racist now, father. Then it automatically assumed that you're either a football hooligan or please say it, please, or a member of the BNP. <laughs> yes! Dave and I. Oh, God. Oh, God. I just caught my jacket on my chair and ripped it. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, it's just the inside. Is it just the inside? Oh, it's just the inside. That's great news. Woo! Wouldn't like that. Wouldn't like that. Sort myself out. But if there is one thing I do feel slightly proud of, it's the humble British dessert. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end of today's episode. It's been great. We should definitely do this again soon. In fact, I'm going to do it again right now, Dave, so it's true, because I'm going to record two episodes in a row. That's efficiency, baby! Let's go! It's awesome inventions that never caught on, by the way, just in case you were curious. You probably weren't. Put a bump